Our gospel lesson for today is from the Good News According to Luke, chapter 12, beginning at the 13th verse. We're on page 1,617 in your pew Bibles. Luke 12, the 13th verse, where the subheading reads, The Parable of the Rich Fool. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich toward God. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the lilies grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things, and your Father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Here ends the reading of the good news. Let us pray. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Isn't it amazing, week after week, how the old, old words of Jesus, spoken aloud about 2,000 years ago, can smack us right between the eyes on a Sunday morning? Jesus, today, teaches about money and idolatry, the worship of false gods. And he does it often in the gospel. It gets our attention because we like money. Years ago, I read a book called The Hard Sayings of Jesus, and predictably, it spent a good deal of time talking about the teachings of Jesus that are really hard, like loving our enemies and turning the other cheek, and it talked a lot about words of judgment that are harsh. But it did not include today's lesson, and I have to tell you that personally, A part of today's gospel lesson, I think, for me, are some of the hardest words in Scripture. I tell you, therefore, Jesus says, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will wear. I don't know about you, but I think part of the worry gene is in my DNA. I think I was born this way. There are things in life that make me anxious and worry, and especially about the future. 
Plus, it seems to me that barely a day goes by where I don't see an advertisement about planning ahead for the future, about making sure your future is secure, about having good financial planning or a good life insurance policy. Maybe that's a reflection on the fact that I watch too much golf and they're always sponsored by those organizations. But I think those ads are out there all the time in newsprint and on television and on the radio. Plus, we are told by experts that a vast majority of people in the United States are living either paycheck to paycheck or they are only a month away from financial crisis should income stop for them. What? Me worry? You betcha. Economic realities are real. So this is a very hard saying of Jesus. Do not worry about your life. What do we do with that? It seems completely opposite of what Jesus is teaching us as to how we often feel. Do we just ignore Jesus or do we dig deeper into God's word and see what he's trying to teach us? To try to understand why he's so concerned about this issue. After all, I need to remind you, God does not hate money. God hates our love of money. So I think it's important that we take a little time this morning to look again at God's holy word, to see the ways that God is trying to teach us to keep him first. How amidst old, old words, the Holy Spirit works to teach us new things. That's amazing. Let's go to the book of Ecclesiastes, which Wally read a couple of sections for us this morning. And we are only getting a part of the picture of that book, by the way. This is the part of Ecclesiastes that I like to call the belly-aching section. The oh, poor me section. The cartoon character from long ago called Droopy. We're all doomed. Ecclesiastes takes some time to kind of bring and bubble to the surface lots of things that some of us worry about or whine about. But if you and I had the time this morning to read the whole book and put it in its context of God's entire witness of Scripture, we'd see that it is completely balanced out, or maybe even better, completely canceled out by another important truth. Love and respect for God, a real devotion in serving God first in all things, is what gives life meaning. Let me say that another way. Worship of self leads to despair. Worship of false gods leads to a chasing after the wind. But true worship of God leads to hope and joy. Service to God through serving others leads to fulfillment and peace and a sense of real purpose and meaning in life. That's a hard lesson for us to learn. But our lesson from Colossians echoes the same thing in a little bit different way. Set your minds on things above, the Apostle Paul says, not on earthly things. I don't know how many of you have ever seen the TV reality show, Say Yes to the Dress. By the way, reality show TV, what a weird title for that stuff, huh? Nothing could be further from reality than most reality TV. Anyway, Say Yes to the Dress is all about a bride picking out her wedding gown and her family coming along to approve or help her choose. It's all about the dress. Well, Paul reminds us today that it is important what we put on, but he's not talking about earthly clothing. I want to remind you that we are called to be the bride of Christ. How does Christ want us to be dressed for this marriage, this partnership? Paul says that we are to put on 
things that you can't buy at a store. Humility, kindness, gentleness. He says, above all this, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect unity. It's good to be reminded that what really matters is not something you can buy. But it is something you can see and experience and feel. The truth is, most of us aren't very interested in ever wearing a $15,000 wedding gown. We look at that and we say, that's absolutely plain crazy. But the hard truth is, you and I both struggle on that fine line between wants and needs, don't we? We do struggle with idolatry, with greed, with materialism. We struggle with what it means to be rich toward God. How do we do that? Honestly, it's a lifetime lesson. At least it's been that way for me. And it seems to me it's not a lesson that we could ever do perfectly in this life. But God keeps calling us and forgiving us, inviting us to strive to keep him first in all things. It's the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. Not because God is power hungry. Not because God thinks that somehow we'll get out of hand if we don't do that. It's more of a sense that God wants us to keep him first because he loves us. Because God knows that that's the only way that we will find peace and joy and meaning in life. God wants what's best for us, but that best is not earthly stuff. God's best comes through service and love and faithfulness. We don't need to build bigger barns. We don't need to be called a fool for chasing after the wind. Instead, let's let the wind of the Holy Spirit blow in us and through us. Let's invite God to take charge of us, to build bigger hearts in us, so that we know everything we have is a gift from God, and that's the point. Everything we have is a gift from God. There's no need to hoard it, and therefore there's no need to worry about it. When we get that it's God's first, then we learn that it's just fine to give it all away because there's way more where that came from. For the Christian, we need to remember that living equals giving. It's not an easy lesson, but it is the way to life. Let us pray. Lord God, instead of building a bigger barn, help me build a bigger heart, a place where you dwell. Instead of looking for security in things, empower me to see you alone. And instead of worrying about this life, keep my eyes focused on eternal life with you. Help us, Lord, all to turn our living into giving. Amen.